Wow, look at that burger. The hamburger is approximately 117 years old and is at the heart of what might be the most celebrated cuisine in the world. Let us dive into the hamburger's historical roots. In the year 1238, Genghis Khan's grandson Kublai Khan invaded Moscow. They naturally brought their unique dietary ground meat with them. The people of Russia soon adopted it into their own cuisine with the name Steak Tartar. Over many years, Russian chefs adapted and developed this dish by refining it with chopped onions and raw eggs. Throughout the 15th and 16th century, Hamburg, Germany was a major port of Russia's trade operations. So the famous meat came along for the ride. Between 1820 and the First World War, nearly 6 million Germans immigrated to the US and so did their culinary traditions. Believe it or not, at the time, raw meat was used as medicine for digestive issues. In 1867, New York doctor James Salisbury suggested that cooking the beef patties could be just as healthy. Thus, the Salisbury steak was born. When it comes to the exact roots of the American hamburger, there are several claims to who invented it. 1885 was a big year for the hamburger's claim to fame. From the Menches brothers in Akron, Ohio, to Hamburger Charlie in Seymour, Wisconsin. But it wasn't until the year 1900 that the United States Library of Congress gave all credit to Lewis Lassen from Lewis's Lunch in New Haven, Connecticut as the person who invented the hamburger. His beef patty was served between two slices of toast without any condiments. In 1904, Fletcher Davis from Athens, Texas made headlines at the St. Louis World Fair who took his recipe there and sold out. He claimed to have been selling beef sandwiches since the 1880s. It wasn't until 1925 that cheese was put onto a hamburger. 1935 was the birth year of the name Cheeseburger. On December 12, 1948, the McDonald's brothers opened their doors for business in San Bernardino, California. And in Canada, here are some of the first burger chains to emerge. In 1956, A&W opened up its first hamburger restaurant in Winnipeg, Manitoba. In 1962, Peter's Drive-In in Calgary opened its doors for business. Here's an interesting fact. Between 1962 and 1964, Tim Hortons had a restaurant in North Bay, Ontario, and they served hamburgers and hot dogs. In 1967, the Big Mac was invented, and in 1968, McDonald's opened up its first Canadian operation in Richmond, B.C. 37 million Canadians consumed approximately 830 million hamburgers in 2019, and 331 million Americans consume approximately 50 billion hamburgers every year. Luckily for us, we have two Calgarians that know how to represent the hamburger's legacy exceptionally well. Meet Dave Sturries and Karen Co, owners and operators of Empire Provisions and co-owners of Little Empire Burger. Karen is a certified wine steward and sommelier with the International National Somalia's Guild. She has studied at the Pacific Institute of Culinary Arts. She has over 20 years of experience in the food and beverage industry. Dave Sturries is a former environmental scientist that later chose a new path on becoming a meat scientist. Hey Dave, what you got cooking for us today? So we got to toast buns. Typically when we do it at the shop, we're all, or here, we're toasting first and then they're sitting off to the side and we kind of dress them and do our burgers, get them quick to order. Um, so I'm just testing the, the grill right now, just the heat, but we're going to grill the rest of these. Did you cure this mortadella? Yeah, we made it at the shop. We have a piece of equipment there, it's called the buffalo chopper and it's like a giant uh, food processor and it just keeps whipping and chopping uh, your meat so that's what we do our hot dogs in and uh, mortadella do any sort of emulsification and then we stuff the casing and this is a cooked product so it's not casing or sorry it's not cured but it's just steamed and uh, cooked. Yeah. Wow. What are the buns made of? Uh, these are Martin's potato rolls so they're the uh, Kind of the most infamous uh, American burger bun out there. Yes. So it's soft enough, but it's strong enough to withstand all the sauce and the fat from the patty. Uh, yeah, really good. And what about the sauces you're adding here? What you got going on? Um, 
So on the top part of the bun, we have our uh, signature uh, Little Empire secret burger sauce. And on the bottom, we have French's mustard. Uh, so in the burger sauce is just a mixture of all the things you want on your burger. There's ketchup, we put some in there. Uh, probably said too much already, it's super <laughs> secret. And then uh, just our regular kind of kosher dill pickles. Oh my goodness. We all love pickles around here, so we give a healthy amount. And then we're going to finish it off too with just a little bit of iceberg lettuce for that crunch. Do you remember your first burger, Dave? Um, I actually remember going to A&W back in the day with my dad <laughs> and getting the drive in and they would bring the tray and put it on your uh, side window and probably dating myself with that, but... Uh, what was your go-to at the time? I would say probably just a cheeseburger, simple cheeseburger. Love the onion rings, still do to this day. I think a and is like a very Western Canadian thing because we just did not eat a and in Ontario growing up. And what was a go-to for you when you were a kid? Oh, I ate Big Macs like crazy. <laughs> like I crushed them. I grew up on fast food. I ate all, all of it. Through the power of social media and how I came to know the Empire Provisions brand on a Saturday morning, waking up thinking I want a burger. I see the Smash Burger, the feature Smash Burger online. I think it was a hashtag Burger YYC. And then I find myself at the Empire Provisions location having the, the feature burger for the first time. I just got goosebumps. Uh, it was the closest thing that I had had to a Shake Shack burger in this city. I'm like, oh my God, I don't need to travel all the way to New York City. Right, well now more so than ever, now that we can't travel, we're trying to bring a little bit of some sort of familiarity or, you know, something reminiscent of our travels back to the city. So, yeah. Should we start smashing? Uh, so we smash with uh, a parchment paper just so your smasher doesn't stick to your burger. Wow. And we really just drive it home. And then with the mortadella, we do a little kind of cut on each kind of corner. And that's just so it doesn't kind of curl up and so you get a really nice uh, sear on it. Our regular Little Empire with cheese uh, in all our burgers is we hit the top with some onions and then when we flip it over, uh, the burger cooks and its fat kind of cooks the onions on the griddle. So these cook pretty darn quick. That's what we're looking for all the time. We love it. Our beautiful American cheese. One, this is beautiful. Oh my God. <laughs> this is breakfast. So once the cheese melts, we're, uh, we're ready to go. It's so exciting. This is not fair. It's incredible. Oh, oh. So where do you serve this mortadella feature that is kind of a rare experience? Uh, we actually ran this as a feature at Empire for a bit, and I think next month we're going to run it as a feature here. Uh, we're going to uh, probably do a quarterly uh, special feature at Little Empire going forward. Beautiful. Well, it definitely like ties it all together too, the Empire Provision story and then Little Empire. I mean, the mortadella comes from the shop. So this is our mortadella that we're making. We're using barren flour farms, pork for this. I mean, it's all naturally raised. We don't really with it too much. So, you know, our has a much softer, silkier texture. Um, and, you know, we make it in a size that happens to be perfect alongside of a burger patty. For a burger, so, yeah. Yeah. So proud of you guys. Thanks, man. So appreciate that. Guys. I mean, yeah, we always looked at this as there's no one in Canada really doing burgers like this. It's, you know, there's Burger Priest in Toronto that I understand does a pretty good job and there's a couple spots in Toronto, but other than that, there's, there's no one doing it. There's no, like, national kind of burger chain. Not that we're there yet, but uh, you know, it's something we want to work towards. Keep on dreaming because I believe in the dream. Yeah. The one thing I'll mention about when we do uh, toast the buns, you can use butter, but we use mayonnaise. Uh, just gets a bit of a browner, um, a browner grill on it. Uh, we always toast our buns. We like them nice and warm. Toast the buns. Toasty buns.
Dave, you grew up in Edmonton. Yep. I assume you're an Edmonton Oilers fan. That's right. And begrudgingly Oilers. <laughs> yeah. Little Empire actually has something in common with Wayne Gretzky. You know, okay. you know what that is? We're the greatest? <laughs> well, perhaps, yeah. I think you're, you're, you're definitely up there with the great ones of, of the hamburger game for sure. But so Wayne Gretzky pre-game would eat between one to four hot dogs before every game. And so they figure that over the span of his life, he's consumed over 7,200 hot dogs. I don't know about that fact. With onions, mustard, relish every time. A total, I saw a Reddit post where this guy calculated the amount of calories consumed just hot dogs by the great one. 2.1 million calories <laughs> All right. by the great one. Okay. So you you have the the hot dog and the great one connected here through Little Empire. We feel his spirit <laughs> in this restaurant this morning. Who knew an athlete's diet could be hamburgers and hot dogs? That's right. I heard that your Esposito sausage is award winning. Why, what makes it award winning? Well, coincidentally, you mentioned Tony Miliorese, and uh, we had a family sausage off at. Uh, this dinner we did at Cilantro back in the day. Tony's partner at the time actually voted for ours, thinking it was his, and that was the deciding vote. So, so that's our oh, award. Wow. So we're in Bridgeland right now. And uh, what can you tell us your journey on becoming a meat scientist in the basement of Tony Migliaris's house and that fridge you had for your experiments with curing meats and, and, and meat uh, cutting. Yeah, it's, you know, growing up, my mom immigrated from Italy, so my uncles and aunts were always making sausage. Uh, they do it probably three or four times a year. And uh, so that's where I got my first interest in it. And then some of my uncles did cured meat as well. And then uh, it just kind of kept going from there. Karen and I always wanted to have our own sandwich shop. And we're like, well, we like these cured meats on our sandwiches that we would get uh, from Italian markets back in the day. And uh, it just got to the point where we started making some, and then I got a job at a butcher shop, and then started experimenting more, and Tony had a fridge in his basement. And then we also had a fridge at Cilantro restaurant as well. So we would make uh, some salamis and then throw them in those fridges and give it a try that way and experiment. And we didn't get sick, so we were okay. And then. Uh, and then I got lucky enough and worked at Teatro and got to play around with their charcuterie program. And, and then from there, we went to the basement at Una and uh, really expanded and started Empire. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Karen, when you grew up um, in Niagara Falls, the 905. Yeah. Uh, you know, you probably learned a lot. You know, from the oh, work no. ethic. The work ethic. How of, did you get these? Of, <laughs> of, of, of Souvenir Mart, right? I might cry. What? What? Uh, what can you tell us about Souvenir Mart? It, it was my upbringing, so it was my home when I was a kid, and uh, it was my parents' store. So my parents immigrated over. Uh, from the Philippines, my mom first, she was a nurse, as many Filipinas were, uh, coming over to Canada uh, back in sort of like late 60s, 70s. Um, my father came shortly after and, you know, and the full immigrant experience. They, um, you know, both started with, you know, sort of a very little, like very little knowledge of, you know, where they were coming to and really just wanted to be immersed as Canadians. and. Um, wanted to make a new life for themselves, a, you know, what they would consider to be like a better life and opportunity for them than the Philippines could afford them at the time. And so through a series of, you know, I don't want to say odd jobs, but my father did like a lot of sort of door-to-door -door sales jobs and um, different types of uh, industries 
before he decided that he thought he would try and like, take a big leap into entrepreneurship and start his own business. And I mean, if you have been to Niagara Falls, it's incredibly campy. At the time, it was where you could still maybe tout that it was like the honeymoon capital of the world. It still had the heart-shaped jacuzzis. It was, I mean, some places still have it, but you know, like, you know, it was a romantic place to go. People wanted to have a little bit of a keepsake. So my dad started the business um, by himself at first, but my mom, you know, really wanted to work alongside of him and be his partner, not just in life, but in business. Uh, and so actually our original um, store was called Anne's Gift Shop, which is my mom's name. Um, and it just grew from there. I mean, they were business, business partners for 40 years. They spent every day together. As kids, we grew up and uh, we got pulled into it. Uh, I mean, obviously it primed me for being able to do this with Dave today. There, it was a huge part of my childhood. I, I mean, I grew up around baubles and uh, weird snow globes and you know novelty mugs and 99 cent t-shirts and um, we did this you know as as a family business for you know they did it for 40 years before they retired and uh, I mean they're kind of like people who know my parents and like the souvenir world in Niagara like they have lots to say about them they were incredibly generous people they shared their knowledge they didn't believe like I mean you know you're competitive because you're a business owner and now there's a million souvenir shops, you know, back to back in Niagara Falls. But at the time, you know, they just they just saw the opportunities that were afforded to them, and they opened it up for other people. Like their first store that they bought, we lived on top of it. Um, and I mean, we weren't there for very long as the family grew. We obviously moved into a larger house. But like our my early years, we were we lived on the busiest street in, in Niagara Falls, which was Lundy's Lane. Yeah, these shots are actually hard to find. I actually had to really yeah, dig, fly to Niagara Falls. Dig, <laughs> dig, dig for them. Well, you take no. this show seriously. <laughs> I'm gonna, I got a little something for um... Dave. What can you tell us about Andrea Pirlo? The greatest Italian footballer in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Handsome, loves wine, loves food, uh, but uh, played for the national team forever and. Uh, uh, just set the pace of the uh, the entire game. He was just he's called the maestro and uh, also known as the metronome because he just actually like set the pace on how the game was played. And uh, eventually he played for Milan forever, and then he went to go play for Juventus towards the end of his career, which is a team I support. So I got to finally really support him and cheer for him. And uh, we went to um, after his career in uh, Italy, he went to play in New York and then did a trip uh, with two of my close friends, one being Tony again, and my our business partner, Shovik, and we went to go watch the Whitecaps play uh, New York and got to see them. We were, played fanboys for a while, it was pretty fun. How did you feel um, 2015 Champions League final? Here's a picture of you pre-game <laughs> with Shovik. And Tony Miggs, pre-game, everybody is on the same playing level field. We don't know who's going to win. Having a good time, <laughs> ready for the sport, ready for the game. How, how, I love Shovik's beard you, did, in that. How did you feel at the time? Do you think Juventus could actually beat Barcelona at the time? I had hope, but I knew it was going to be a long shot. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Barca you, was the best. Have you recovered from the, the pain <laughs> of losing a Champions League? <laughs> Final? <laughs> Have you recovered? Uh, it's so good. I love uh, we that lost picture. actually a couple after that to Barcelona again. So it's uh, they drove the knife home. They're so good though. It was just an honor being there. Yeah. <laughs> show Vic. I mean, show uh, Vic. I mean, there's he's nothing the like. Worst. He's, <laughs> he's, a, he's a poor loser and he's a poor, even poor winner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just love. I, I, I don't personally know Shovik, but that's something like I would look like after uh, Liverpool FC beat uh, Tottenham Hotspurs last year in the, or uh, two years ago in the Champions League final. So I know that feeling very well. And I also know the feeling of, of losing a Champions League final. We lost to Real Madrid three years ago. So it's a, it, it took me a, like a month to digest the pain of, of that loss. So. That was a really great evening. I remember that. I was at Tony's old place. It was actually when Tony lived in Bridgeland that we went. I went and met up with these guys afterwards and they were like well, well into the pocket at that point. But 
Uh, it was quite fun for me. Yeah. It was actually an amazing day too. Uh, Tony's father and his uncle were in town and uh, uh, we had great spread, great lunch, great everything, had some drinks and uh, um, since then his father and his uncle have passed away unfortunately and uh, but we had such a great day today with, or a great day that day with them. And, oh. Yeah, that's a really good, those are some good memories to, uh, yeah. to pull out. My, I, minus is the loss. <laughs> So what can you tell us about this man? Well, I mean, we we're talking about, we're going to talk about the greatest. We're going to, we're going to talk about the greatest. I'm like, I mean, I think anyone who knows me knows that I am a gigantic Prince fan. Was hands down, like in my top concerts that we've seen, we went, and it was nuts. Like we were so close, like we could see like the Paisley designs, like you on his pants. You see the foundation pants. on his Yeah, skin. yeah, I can, I can talk forever about Prince. Something in common, both of you, with Prince, you know, his love for food in Prince's fridge at all times, he would keep something that you sell here as a product, a gallon of it at all times in his fridge. Was it mayo? And I brought you a gift today. It's the <laughs> Prince, the 1999 kimchi. I, it's a label that I created for you with Roy O's uh, oh, kimchi yeah, from Roy so O's good. Kitchen. I that's, love Roy's kimchi too. So right, so that's Roy's kimchi, but with that Prince label. This is so great. Yes, <laughs> and <laughs> what's what's interesting is he loved kimchi so much. A gallon a time, he Prince had up to nine, eighteen, nineteen mustards in his fridge at all times. That's what I have in common with Prince. I am obsessed with mustard. He is obsessed with mustard, that's so for sure. So this was Prince's favorite so mustard. Many presents. Oh my Raspberry goodness. Raspberry like... mustard for you Thank and your you. collection. Oh, this is amazing. I, like I'm a serious mustard connoisseur. <laughs> this is great, you're like the Oprah of Calgary. Just like, <laughs> what's under my seat? You deserve it, right? Oh You're, man, this you is so it. nice. Uh, the, the funny thing, Prince's guilty pleasure on my research and food was Dunkaroos. Oh really? He wow, loved that's a throwback. Dunkaroos. And then I'm trying to find Dunkaroos for the interview and uh, they discontinued it in Canada because of the high content of sugar for kids. So it's only available in the States right now. I haven't had breakfast yet, so. Dave, what can you tell us about this band right here? Oh. Greatest. The best band, yeah. One of our favorites. We've seen them twice together, coincidentally. Uh, the first time we went on separate trips to Vancouver oh. and uh, ended up at the uh, same spot outside at uh, the Thunderdome at BC Stadium. And then uh, a couple of years back, we went to go see them in Montreal at the, uh, not the Forum, but uh, whatever it is now. Bell Center. Bell Center, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's such a great, a great venue. time. Yeah. yeah. Amazing venue. I'd love to actually go watch a hockey game there. I know you guys are big art fans. This is also a takeaway for you. Um, oh. <laughs> this is a takeaway oh, for you. Oh my God, you. it's sweet. You know, this <laughs> album, A Moon right? Shape Pool, in 2000, so this came out on May 8, 2016. And so a rad. bunch of like loyal Radiohead fans, May 6, 2016, made a plea with the band. Tom York, if you don't release this album tonight by midnight, we're gonna eat your face. So all these fans <laughs> on, on a subreddit, there's videos on YouTube where they print Tom York's face and peel one piece of his face at a time as a plea to release the album now. So they released the album two days later. And today what I have for you guys is we're actually gonna eat Tom York's face <laughs> together. We're gonna eat his face. Um, and, and you notice he's actually wearing a space suit on there and that's an homage to you from Tom York with your fascination with NASA. Yeah. Damn. Oh, Cause space is cool. Yeah. Let's uh, eat his face. Let's eat his face. Okay. Hey Tom York, much love to you. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. I did not expect this interview to go this way. Yeah. I, had, I had no idea what we were getting into. Cheers, Cheers to Tom to York Radiohead. In his face. Mm. This is good, amazing. So these were made 
by Cake Bake Shop in Mackenzie Town. Thank you, Cake Bake. What can you tell us, uh, Karen, about the only person that was able to successfully boss you around? Ah. He believe I'm gonna say he believes he was bossing her around, <laughs> but she was actually bossing him around. Uh, well, this is one of my closest friends now. Uh, that's a gentleman named Devin Morrison, uh, who has worked in this industry almost as long as I have, and is also a Niagara Falls native, so much respect to that. Um, Devin was my boss uh, at Teatro when I was working at the Teatro Group, but when Dave and I moved back to Calgary, I only wanted to work at one place, um, mainly because I thought, you know, I wanna maybe serve some tables for a bit while Dave and I try and figure out what we're gonna do with this business idea that really hasn't come into fruition and we don't really necessarily have a plan, but we probably need some funds. So not just because he's my friend, but because during that time he opened a door that I didn't, need, didn't even know I wanted to walk through. You know, he was someone who said, you know, he allowed me in my sort of my industrious way to kind of just grow into a position. I, you know, did a lot of things while I was there with that group, you know, and a lot of them helped me to, um, start this business. I got to be extremely creative. Uh, I got to take on projects where I had very limited knowledge but got to learn along the way. Um, it, he valued my input and respected me so you know obviously that was of high value as well and I mean we opened you know two properties and uh, in the time that I was there that were that are you know that were really fun concepts and I got to see it from you know start to finish and and that was amazing so it really did help like set the foundation for where I am now and then from that I gained some of the best friendships that I've had he, he is definitely up there in that we love to make fun of him because he's a good person to roast because he achieves a lot of success naturally you know he's a very talented person on many fronts, um, you know, as a boss and also, you know, even as a skateboarder. The last question I have for you today is the last meal. What would the spread of a last meal look like for you and Dave? What would those plates be? My mom is the best cook and uh, so she would take our award-winning Esposito sausage and she just slow cook it in tomato sauce, and then she did these other uh, called uh, it's bruschette, and uh, so it's pounded out. Uh, you either use beef or pork. She uses pork, and then it's just um, garlic and parsley wrapped in there, and that's also slow cooked in the sauce. And then uh, so yeah, it's the best. She, yeah, she cooks up a bunch of pasta. Take the meat out. You basically have a bowl of meat uh, that's also coated in sauce, and then she tosses the pasta in that sauce and it is the absolute best. And uh, our sausage slow cooked in tomato sauce is outstanding. It's put so much flavor into the tomato sauce and uh, oh, that's number one for sure. Yeah, I would eat that every day, but I'd die. <laughs> what about you? Well, well, I mean, it would be my dad making me breakfast. Um, I guess I call it my dad's breakfast. So, cause I make it now too and I make it for Dave. Uh, which is very simple. It's um, garlic fried rice um, over easy egg on top, crispy bacon, and like Dave and I like tear it up and like mix mix everything together. My dad still actually eats everything very com compartmentalized. It's very funny, but um, yeah, I mean that's what I grow up eating every day. I did eat. Yes, I ate bacon every day before I went to school, and uh, yeah, it was a, a ritual thing for myself and my father. That would be hands down, like if we're talking about something that like would be a feast or something that we would share. I mean, we're, we're actually going like breakfast, lunch, and dinner now, so <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, it, you know, it, for me, it would also be like something that Dave would make me, so pasta's definitely up there. I'm, I'm a bit of a creature of habit now, like when it comes to what I like to eat. I, I'm very simple. I think I've had a great benefit of traveling the world, especially when it was for work and for wine. If, eating in some very fine restaurants and I still love that but the food that I crave the food that like brings me comfort or brings me like the most joy is something that, that speaks with a story to it and it is almost always something that is quite simple you know so like my birthday this year I had I requested pasta and I requested spaghetti and meatballs and it was dynamite 
Hey, back to Prince on that funny fact. He would only eat spaghetti if it was paired with orange juice. What? I swear. I swear. You've got lots of Prince facts. Oh, oh yeah. Like, I, I had that to. That is yeah. the strangest combo. So I have a gift from uh, for you from Jen Thiessen from Jen Marie Arts. This was uh, something that it, it, it was Ew. done by her for both of you. You, you like opening gifts. I it's do. Good. I really do. I, I, I say I don't like gifts, but I like the unwrapping of them. It's extremely kind. Amazing. Oh man. I'm glad they captured my uh, <laughs> silver hair on the side. Oh my god. That is so good. Is that great? Look at it. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you, Jen Thiessen, <laughs> for making such a beautiful piece of art for Karen and oh, Dave here to, so to put great. on a mantle somewhere yeah. in their home, perhaps oh, in yeah. the kitchen. Thank you so much, Karen and Dave, Thanks, for Eddie. taking this the is time fun. to feature uh, this incredible. Morta Della feature burger here at Little Empire Bridgeland. Um, yeah, I'm, I'll be forever grateful for this moment with you too, and I, I look forward to working with you in the future. Oh man, thank you. Right. Thank you These so are, much. This is great. We are, yeah, this is like, amazing. I can't. There's so we much. Are tickle trunk over yeah. there. <laughs> you know. Bottomless. <laughs>